Alright guys, so let's talk about EVs and biofuels. So biofuels were kind of seriously considered in the late 80s, all throughout the 90s, when I was introduced to it back in 96, 97. And still I was con you know, continuing to learn about it up until 2001. For those who don't know, there was a huge event in 2001 and priorities in this country changed. So we were focused mostly on defense, security, and etc. We, we weren't really worried about changing the world. We were more like trying to maintain our country. But that's neither here nor there. So moving forward, biofuels take up an ungodly amount of land, agricultural land, that we could better use for food when we already have better, more efficient alternatives for powering and locomotion. But yeah. In late 80s to the 90s we were trying to replace things like trucking with uh, biofuels we were considering it there's a lot of hydrogen cells that people were kind of getting into for diesel vehicles uh, mining equipment trucking airplanes etc cars wasn't really a thing that they were considering because the thought process was that most people are going to be moving to larger cities and we'll be using electric buses. We'll be using subway systems, etc. Now, for a smaller metropolis like where I live, Boise, Idaho, things are a little bit different. Things are more spread out. There's still probably going to be a nice collection of electric vehicles in the forms of like cars, and maybe a soccer mom wants like you know an electric version of a Toyota. Land Cruiser, or maybe she wants a Forerunner, something like that. Trucks, not so much like the greatest, you know, thing. Uh, the other gentleman I was speaking to, I'll put his link down below. He was kind of mentioning how you lose a lot of power when you have it under load, and that's true, absolutely. And that's going to be the case for anything that you're doing. I mean, you could even look at the rocket equation for the Saturn V and every other rocket that SpaceX has come out with. So it's just obvious at this point. It's just basic physics. What's so Let's move forward. You guys didn't come here for a physics lesson from some professional idiot. Anyways, biofuels, they don't provide what you need. You're, you're looking for power. You're looking for torque. You're looking for efficiency. You're looking for clamping down on pollution. Just all of these factors combined into one. It was a nice niche idea. But when you, it doesn't have very much scalability. Yes, you can make biofuel on your property on your farm fill your trucks with it do whatever you want i don't believe there's any federal laws against that you'll have to look into your local and state laws but as far as scalability for an entire nation we're not going to be able to deviate too far right now from ice which is internal combustion engines based on diesel and unleaded or leaded not unleaded or sorry leaded but based on diesel and leaded fuels unleaded fuels my apologies i'll get it I'll get it. I told you, professional idiot. Anyways, we're, we're not really moving towards that. There were some people after 2001 interested in looking into hydrogen a lot stronger. Like I said, the hydrogen fuel cell. There are some companies right now that they even make their own professional hydrogen fuel cells for your vehicle. It's, it's just hydrogen is very corrosive and you got to be careful. With that in mind, to his other point, EVs being dominant, um, it's going to be a while. As far as I'm concerned, these Tesla vehicles right now, their lower brands, like he mentioned, are just go get yourself a Geo Metro if you want to be, you know, efficient for pollution and gas mileage and all these things. Go get a Geo Metro. You'll be good to go. Okay, that thing gets like 50 miles to the gallon. You're good to go. Um, EVs are extremely expensive. The faster you charge something, just because of physics, the faster it will discharge. So you're losing range. So if you can go ahead and fix that conundrum in physics, uh, congratulations. But if I'm charging, you know, a nine hour battery in an hour, instead of getting like 300 miles to the gallon or to the charge, I might get half that or less. You know, I'd have to go through the math. I'm not gonna do that right now on a YouTube video, but the point is you, you really need to look into scalability being the number one factor because what we're really talking about 
is the United States government funding through grants, etc., and contracts a brand new way of life. Now you might have a small company here or a small company there that springs up and takes advantage of different trends, but at the end of the day, they're all going for that government money and they're trying to get as much funding as they possibly can. Case in point, Tesla. Without government funding, Tesla would have died already. You know it, I know it, it's just the way it is. Life is rough. Now, of course, they're really trying to mass market to the masses to keep their company profitable because it's really not profitable to be selling these high-end machines. Like, I mean, it's profitable enough, but they'd be like the Ferraris of the electric world and not necessarily the, you know, the Camrys of the electric world, which is what they're kind of going for now. Electric cars are just not going to be doing it very big in cities. Cities are starting to restructure their streets. They're moving towards electric buses. They're moving towards trolleys. Uh, you've seen them in places like Chicago and whatnot. And they're moving towards uh, subway systems. Not in all places, but in a great many. We're, we're, we're going to be moving largely towards mass public transportation in your huge sprawling metropolises boise idaho where i'm at we might be using for maybe the next hundred years ev cars and trucks but after that it will be so large over here that we'll probably be doing huge amounts of mass public transportation it's it's never going to be it's a trend that's that's what it is it's a necessary trend for our transition to as populations grow, as people focus more into the cities, etc., etc., etc. But yeah, it's it's just a trend. Make your money while you can. Sell your EVs. Go design one. Everyone wants to do it. It's cool. My senior project is going to be an EV, but I'm designing. We, the team, will be designing one. That's, it's a drag car for racing. But that's not the point. Point is. EVs, he's kind of correct, are, are just, it's not all there. We will be moving probably in the next hundred years to nuclear fusion. I believe we've come the closest we've ever come to sustained nuclear fusion in the past five years where we were sustained for 40 seconds. And to be honest, that's huge. They just built a new nuclear fusion reactor, the biggest one ever. I think it's a Takamuk. Oh, I screwed that word up so bad. I know it. I'll go ahead and post on screen. <laughs> I'll put the links down below as well. We're expecting to be making huge leaps and gains. And if we're making a new reactor every five, 10 years, in a hundred years, yes, we'll probably be moving to large amounts of natural gas, nuclear power sources, and electrifying everything that we possibly can. The reason being is because solar panels, no matter how much progress we make on those, they're never gonna be so super efficient that we can have fewer and fewer and fewer super efficient solar panels. So basically you're gonna have these fields of solar panels that are cooking airplanes and birds out of the sky. That's a problem. You're also gonna have a problem when it comes to dams, killing fish and disrupting ecosystems since they can't go back up the river, etc. You're going to have issues with wind farms. They're not terribly consistent, but if you want to, you know, do the math for consistency, it's a very low rate on return. Yeah, it's, there's, there's a lot involved. There's a lot involved. I specialize in vehicle design and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, if you wanted to get into alternative energies, or nuclear fusion. I recommend like Idaho right now, we have one of the number one nuclear fusion, or sorry, nuclear engineering programs in all of Idaho and I believe in the Pacific Northwest. Yes, Idaho is part of the Pacific Northwest. We do have some crazies, just like every state has crazies. And we have some progressives and some liberals and some conservatives and people like me, a moderate, because I tend to not be so much of an extremist these days, having gone to school and educated myself on critical thinking and analytical thought. That's another topic altogether elsewhere. I don't want to talk about it. Point being, 
um yeah nuclear engineering if you want to do it idaho is very cheap very cheap to live in very cheap to go to school and the nuclear engineering degree program that we have here will set you up for literally life one thing to bear in mind right now nuclear engineers are not in demand so if i get like 10,000 people that want to come over here to the school uh a lot of you will be denied we just don't have the room for you no offense not trying to hurt your feelings number two uh what are we supposed to do with 10,000 nuclear engineers when we only need 2,000 you know what i'm saying nuclear engineers don't tend to quit and they tend to stay in nuclear engineering for a very long time so yeah you're basically just kind of waiting for the senior guys to die so that you can take their spot <laughs> kind of like a law firm it's it's horrible ah uh, this is a long video we're at 10 11 minutes right now i don't know i might be able to cut this in pieces but when i record my phone I, I don't expect that so just just so we're all on the same page yes it's uh it's just an in-depth conversation uh, i'll post this just in case you guys are curious to know and want to know a little bit more about it i'll put some links down below in the description but with that being said i'm gonna let you go and i got neighbors screaming so i'll see you guys in the next one see ya